Hey everybody, before we begin, in case you missed it, last week I taught a webinar for free about co-producing on Broadway, and it was our most popular webinar yet. If you missed it and are interested in learning more about the ins and outs of co-producing on Broadway, drop me an email at ken at theproducersperspective.com. That's ken at theproducersperspective.com. We'll send you a link. It's a pretty good one. Now on with the podcast. I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be a producer. Hello, everybody. My name is Kent Davenport. This is the Producer's Perspective podcast. I'm super excited to have someone I've known for a very long time on the podcast today, the Tony-nominated choreographer, Mr. Sergio Trujillo. Welcome, Sergio. Thank you, Ken. I'm thrilled to be here. So, Sergio has a litany of shows on his resume. A Bronx Tale, On Your Feet, Adam's Family, the Tony Award winning Memphis, and that little, little show that wasn't a success at all called Jersey Boys. This season, he's going to put summer on Broadway in the spring. So, Sergio, let's just start about the beginning. Like most choreographers out there, you started as a dancer, is that right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. My first show was, um, my first show on Broadway was Drum Rummage Broadway in nine, almost 30 years ago, actually. Wow. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I had, um, I had quite the, I had a, I didn't have a, a long career. I was in expandable 10 years. My first show was Jerome Roman's Broadway, and my last show was Fosse. So it doesn't get as good as that. Yeah, yeah from, from Jerome to Bob. I know. The masters. The masters. The masters of, you know, in terms of choreographer, directors. And where were you from originally? So I'm, I'm originally from Colombia. I was born in Colombia. And then at the age of 12, my family immigrated to Toronto. You know, it was easier to get into Canada uh, than America at that time. And uh, that's where my whole family, my, my family, all my family lives there now. And then at the age of 24, 25, I moved to New York to, you know, to come and be a dancer and, and give it a try. You know, see if I can make it in, in a great wide way. And uh, here we are 30 years later. <laughs> and where did your love of dance begin? Like, what was the first time that you experienced dance or were like, oh, my God, I got to do that? Well, you know, I mean, dance has always been a part of my family. My family, I mean, they're insane. They're, they're you know, I love them to death. You know, they're just, you know, my family is, is music and dance. When you go to a wedding, you go to, even, even if you go to my sister's on a weekend, everyone's gathered around and they're always listening to music. So music and dance has always been part of my family. But real, like the first time I saw dance was at a theme park in, in Canada. Uh, it was called Canada's Wonderland. It had just opened and I went to see this, my friend, one of my friends took me to see the show called The Best of Broadway. And I watched the show and I just thought, oh my God. You know, and, and growing up in, the, in Latin America, we're not we're not big on musicals. My family was not big on going to the theater. You know, it's social economics. It's just not in our radar. That's not what we do. That's not what our families did. So having the opportunity of going to see this show in a theme park, but doing a show called The Best of Broadway, and I saw those guys, and I thought, oh my God, that's exactly what I want to do. So that was that was my first time that I saw dance. And you were how old then? I was 18. That's very late for yeah. a dancer to I, get started. So did. what what did you, what was the first thing you do? You're 18 years old. You're fully formed now, right? Because so many dancers start very young, and their bodies are formed by, it seems, the classes and all the work they do. So what's the first thing you well, the first thing I did, you know, well, I had a series of auditions. Actually, I had a sort of trial audition for it. So I saw that show and I thought, oh, my God, oh, I can do that. I had never taken a dance class in my life. So I found that they were having auditions. I went, you know, I think it was like maybe a year later. And I auditioned. I made up my own combination. I had no training. I choreographed my own routine to Earth, Wind, Fire's Fantasy. And uh, of I, course, just, of I course. just, yes, of course. What a perfect Earth, Wind, song. Fire, of course. Yeah, and it's my theme song. You know, it's like if, you ever, if anybody's ever going to play my song, it's going to be, that's my theme song. But anyway, so I went to that audition and I flailed around. And, you know, they, they saw this kid with all of this immense talent. So, you know, they... And they took me aside and they said, you know, you're not you're not right for this. You need to go train. And that's what I did. So I took it upon myself to to, you know, I became obsessed with dance. And so and I was always catching up. I was always feeling like, you know, I'm, I'm trailing behind. There's guys that have been dancing for 10, you know, 15 years before I got there. People have been dancing there were four or five years old. So I, I just I just became obsessed with it. And, and it was always just just really focused and really focused on what I wanted to do. 
So I, that's why I came to New York. I came to New York to, um, I took time off from school. I was going to university. I was studying chiropractic. I went to the University of Toronto and studied biochemistry. Then I went to chiropractic school. But during that whole time, I know crazy, right? During that whole time, I was I was studying dance uh, off on the side. I've been really incredibly focused in this man. I was like a, I was like a like an Olympic athlete. You're probably the only choreographer out there that can give his dancers a combination and an adjustment. At Thank the same you. Time. <laughs> Thank you. It's so fascinating because it's not, you failed your first audition, right? You didn't get it. And then your training process, you were always behind. It's not like you were the, the back of the class or the, the end of the list. Yet you kept going despite all that, where a lot of people were like, I'm not, I'm not as good as everyone else. I'm going to give up. What kept you going through all that? I think that there's a little, a little part of, of, of all of us that are still here in New York pounding the pavement, you know, that are still working so hard, you know, that are we're always just, you know, trying to beat the odds. I think that's that's the game of, I think that's what keeps us going. You know, there's a quality that I think the people that, 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 are, that succeed at anything they do, it's it's that, that thing, you know, it's, that, the, it's not the it factor. But, but, you know, I think the it factor works for actors, singers, dancers, dancers, but I think for us that continue to do what we do, you know, you're, you're such an established producer, an established choreographer, and we've worked very hard to get here. I think had we paid attention to the no's, to the obstacles, I think we would have stopped, but I just I just kept going. I think there's always that little voice in me that said, you can do it. You know, as, as you know, crazy as that may sound, but it is, it's that thing, you know. Also, you know, coming from from Colombia, you know, you're, you're a poor kid, and you just how you just weather it all, you know, based, you know, growing up in in a country that is so poor, and you see your parents work so hard, and you know they're working as factory, and they're doing three jobs, and you see your parents work so hard, and you just think, you know, they can do it, I can do it. That's an amazing story to think about you as a poor kid in Colombia, and now look at where you are today. So you get to New York, you start as a dancer, you obviously get some big success pretty quick, but that's not enough for you. You decide you, you want to be a, a choreographer as well. When did that happen? I know you choreographed your first Earth, Wind, and Fire audition <laughs> sequence, so we know you had instincts early on. I may ask you to shoot a little video of that later, but when did you were like, okay, now I can do this. Now I can, I want to... I want to choreograph. I want to do what these people are teaching me to do. When did that happen? I, you know, I, even 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 before I took classes, even before I did that audition at the age of eighteen years old, I was choreographing numbers for our variety show in in, in high school, and I was I even choreographed the Dream Ballet in Oklahoma. I had never taken a dance class before, so I think that there was always that part of me that wanted to create, that wanted to have the creative freedom of expression, not only by dancing, but also by creating. And um, so that that part of, I, I have, I've always had that part in me. I just think that it was a matter of figuring out at which point was I ready to move on from being a dancer and then moving on to becoming a choreographer where you are, you know, you have the control, you have the freedom of expression, you're not being an instrumental choreographer, but you are, in essence, the creator. And so... During the time that I was dancing, I I I began to to plant the seed of of assisting other choreographers, of watching other choreographers, of seeing how they work. You know, watching Chris Chadman when I did uh, when I did Guys and Dolls on Broadway because I danced in that show, or watching Robbie Marshall when I danced for him and Kiss of a Spider Woman, or we did encores. I assisted him uh, when he was doing Annie. Oh, I can't remember. Shoot, we did a we did a Disney television special. But you know, and Jerry Mitchell, Michael Peters. Debbie Allen, Vince Patterson, all of these choreographers that I was working with, you know, there was I was always watching them. Even my last show, Fosse, when we did Fosse, Andy Blankenbiller and I would stand on the side and we would try to figure out how to make the show better. So, and I knew, and I knew then too that that was going to be my last show. So, you know, it wasn't just that, you know, and, and when I danced, I was I was madly in love with dance. I mean, it was like I loved it so much. You know, it's just like when you dance, I mean, you gotta love it. It's like when you do, you know, when you're when you're a musician, you just gotta love it. But it was the same way when you know. So it was so it was sort of my mind was always just thinking, what what would I do? How would I do that? How would I fix that? So, but first of all, a slight digression. I have to say, having watched you dance in a number of those shows, it was very obvious that you loved what you did. You're an extraordinary dancer. So tell me a little bit about this transition, though. How how hard was it for you to basically say to everybody, okay, 
I have a very successful career as a dancer. You could have done shows after Fosse, I'm sure. Many. And I'm sure many people tried to get you to do them. You were like, no, I'm not doing this. I'm going to choreograph that. How did you get people to take you seriously, to give you a try? What was that transition like? You know, I, I think I think that, again, in life, you sort of have to make decisions. And, and I think that you have to you have to have a really clear vision and path. And so I knew that when I when I when I did Fosse, I knew that was going to be my last show. I had made a decision uh, that I wanted to choreograph and that I was going to choreograph. I knew that being that being a choreographer in New York City was extremely competitive. Having you know worked with Jerry and and Mitchell and being there at his auditions, danced in some of the auditions. I mean, I was in the in the creative team and his pre-production team when he did the audition for Guys and Dolls to choreograph on Broadway. Chris Chadman ended up choreographing. But so having seen that, you know, that Jerry was competing, Rob Marshall was competing, Rob Ashford, Kathleen Marshall, I was like, oh my God, well I'm not going to be able to compete with these guys. I just got you. So. I'm Canadian, you know. I'm Colombian, Canadian, American. <laughs> I'm, I'm United Nations. No, I thought, you know, okay, so I'm either going to stay in New York and try and really like compete against all of these guys who've been at it for for 15 years already, or am I going to be a, a big fish in a small pond? So I decided to choreograph in Toronto, in Canada. So I, um, I, I was asked to if I would choreograph a revival of West Side Story at Stratton Festival. During the time that I was doing Fosse, and I'm like, oh, but I'm doing Fosse. But I thought, you know what, I'm going to ask for a leave of absence. They gave me the leave of absence. That production of Stratford was very successful. And from that, by working on Stratford, and I got my first big choreographic job, choreographed Peggy Sue Got Married in the West End. So that, you know, so by taking that chance of saying, you know what, so then let me, let me give it a try in Canada and see you know, I had, you know, I, I felt like by assisting all of these different choreographers, I got, I got my master's in choreography, you know, because it's, but also about part of, part of learning and really is by doing. So I've either stayed in New York and did workshops or readings, which are, it's when you really have to deliver, you know, when you're really in the previews and you're really trying to figure out how to fix those numbers and you're watching your work and you're working with a team and you're, when the show is in production is when you're really when you really learn, it's like, sure, it's like a doctor. It's like, you know, you can study the books, but it's not until you start doing that you actually learn it. So I felt like I got a, I got a great, great education by doing it outside of New York. And so it can be affording me those opportunities. I love that story because so many people, I think, when they're pursuing their dreams and their passions, they're like, well, I'm, I'm going to stay in New York because this is where I'm just going to do it. And you made a very specific business decision about, oh, the best way for me to be seen to get better at my craft is to go somewhere where I'll have more opportunities, where I think so many people just sit here and like, I'm just going to sit here and they don't get any attention at all. So talk to me a little bit about your process. Uh, you know, I think when people think about writers, they go, oh, and writer creates something, they sit down and they type into their computer. When a musician composes something, they sit down at a piano and they write the music. How does a choreographer, how do you specifically create? What's that process for you? You know, I think, I mean, it, the, the, the more I've done, the more confident I've become, the more the more of a habit, habits you get about how you begin to work on a, on a project. And so when uh, my husband Jack Nosworthy was doing uh, Mother, uh, Mother Courage at, um, at the public a few, uh, a few years ago, you know, he had, a, he had a chat with her and he said, you know, so how do you get into your character? And the essence of it was that, you know, she finds the character through the voice of the character. You know, how does the character speak? And she's an amazing dialectician. I mean, that is, you know, she just, that's, I think that just transforms her. And it was really interesting. So my point is, is that for me, it's like the way that, so for me, it's, I become restless about how the show moves, how the show dances, how characters dance. And it's really a reaction to the music of the piece is also is my so for me it's not about imposing how I dance how Sergio moves but rather figuring out like what is what is what is the language of of hands on a hard body you know like what is the language of that show and what is the language of Memphis what is the language of Jersey Boys or or Invisible like all so I try to figure out how do I that's the first thing 
And so I spend, no matter how many shows I've done, I'm always like a nervous wreck until I get into the rehearsal room, until I get into my pre-production room where I actually start to dance. Like, and it, it's always, this, it's like, it's like cyclical. It's like, it's a, it's a thing. It's like, and no matter what, I, I lose sleep and I can't sleep. And, and, and my husband says, you're going through that thing again where I can't sleep because I'm, you know, I'll say, oh my God, I haven't been able to sleep. Why? What's wrong with me? But it's really because I'm going again through the, I'm creating again. So, the minute I walk into that room and I just start to dance, even if I spend two hours just sitting there, like just moving a little bit with a couple of the dancers, that's where it begins to, the, the process begins to germinate for me. Like to what, you know, and then I start to find it and I start to create. And sometimes I create more vocabulary, more phrases than I actually do. Now, it's not always just like, you know, dance, me dancing around. You know, there's always, I have the script. I figure out, you know, what section I'm choreographing. I choreograph various. I have a blueprint of each of the numbers. And, and you know, and, and it's really, I'm very pragmatic about it. I'm very organized about it. I even, sometimes I even block them out so that when I walk into the room, I have a blueprint and then I can, then I can play. And, and I'm very reactive to the, the dancers, to the actors, to the, the energy, energy of the room and what people bring to the room. And with, you know, a lot of writers will allow their actors in rehearsal to improv or ad lib or say something. Sometimes that stuff gets into the script. How often do you allow your actors or how do the dancers participate in the process during the rehearsals? Are they, are, do you give them freedom and flexibility? They move around, you're like, oh, that's good, keep that. The sacred time that I have in pre-production, those two, three weeks that I spend before a project, that's where I do it. That's where I, that's where I surround myself with a, with a team of maybe two, two, two or three dancers, dancers that I, that I've, that I've walked. Well, I used to be dancers that I knew that had danced with me. Now they all I have them all working everywhere else that I can't use them in the room. So I'm starting to look for fresh talent. But it's really it's and it's, and it's it, I'm, I'm attracted to dancers that are very very unique that are that are fearless about who they, about taking your work and 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 bringing their own essence into it. But I dance, when I'm in pre-production, I dance full up. I mean, I'm just like in it. I'm a hundred percent. I'm experimenting. I'm moving. I have to dance the material because I have to know what it feels like on the dancers. And then, you know, then I start and I, and I play in the room and, you know, I, I ask the dancers to try this or, or oh, like that. Let's do it. You know, I love the way you've taken my step and you've made it into that. That's good. But I just, you know, here are the arms that I want. So I'm open to it in pre-production. Again, it's my sacred time. It's like going to church. It's just like it is. It's like it's like gospel music. You know, it's just really, really liberating. When I get in the when I get in rehearsal, I build those phrases. I build the vocabulary. I build the map blueprint. You know, I, I'm I'm mostly open with act. You know, because again, I can't impose the way that something feels good on my body on an actor because ultimately, what's going to work is what looks good on that act, and more than anything, what works on the character whoever they're, whatever character they're portraying. Like, like John Lloyd Young and the Jersey Boys. You know, John was not a dancer. And I spent weeks before we started rehearsals. I mean, John was not a great dancer. I spent four weeks, him and I, before we started rehearsals. And I had ideas about what I wanted it to be. But I actually, every single little thing that John did in the show was choreographed. Everything, like when he unbuttoned it, his jacket, when he put it, buttoned it again, how he grabbed the microphone, where he looked. All of it, the finger, the position of the fingers, everything. So I had a map before, and I, and I had a, a, a phrase built into it, but it wasn't until I started working on them that it was because I knew that it was important for an audience to buy into the fact that they were watching Frankie Valli, as opposed to Sergio being Frankie Valli or the choreographer. And they bought into it so much that he won a Tony Award for that. I know. Before, so <laughs> yes. well done. Des Maganoff just remind, reminded me of that. We were auditioning for another show, and I said, you know, I'm not sure that we should hire him. You know, he will need so much work. And he said, yeah, but just remember that, you know, John Lloyd Young won a Tony Award after. <laughs> In other words, you did it before, sir. So yeah, you could do it again. Yeah. Okay, so you, you get, you're a little nervous before pre-production, then things get settled a bit. You have your blueprint. How do you feel when the curtain goes up for the first preview and when an audience is about to chime in and how they feel for the first time? Is it an exciting period for you? Nervous again? What's that like? Again, you know, again, no matter how many shows I do, I still have the same guttural impulse. Like, you can't, I don't think that any of us can predict. I think we can, we can, we can sort of troubleshoot. We can kind of see the number in the room and you can see it even when we're in tech rehearsals and, and you do your first dress rehearsal and you see it. 
when you have that first audience for me and I look at something, I'll go, oh my god, what is wrong with me? Or, okay, 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 I get it. I think I can do better. Or there's always, it's always up for, for me, it's always up for, you know, to, re- for, to reassess. You know, I looked at the whole, you know, I don't nitpick, but I look at the whole piece on, on its own. And yeah, no, I, every time, no matter how many shows I've done, it's the first time I see the audience that, you know, you just get a different perspective. It just, like, the stakes are higher. I don't know what it is. You know, you're still, you're still examining when you're in the room, then when you're in preview, and I mean, in tech rehearsals, you're still looking at it, looking at so many different other factors, but then when you have that first audience, you see the canvas, like you, you step away from it for a second for the first time. And then you go back and read, you know, do the touch-ups once you get going in preview, but it never changes, no matter how many times I've done it. Yeah, I always think it's the first time that first preview of the show is not about you anymore. It's like you're giving up your baby for adoption. For that moment. You get to take it back for <laughs> right. rehearsal. Right. Right. Of the day, but, yeah. Uh, it's yeah. not yours anymore. Yeah. You're handing it over. Yeah. Yeah. Sending your kid off to college. I mean, and ultimately, you know, I think, you know, what we do is not, I mean, it's not, you know, we can't be selfish about what we do because it's not, it, the audience, audience is informed us about, you know, we can have ideas, we can have thoughts, we can have concepts, we think, we may think what works really well, but audiences, you know, really, I mean, if we're really listening to the audience and paying attention, you know, they will they will inform us about the work. And how do you listen for response about choreography or shows? Like, what do you do? Do you just get a sense of the energy in the room? Do you actually no. physically listen to what they're saying or applause or what? What's the biggest indicator of success or not for you during a preview? I think I think ultimately the first and foremost the thing that's more important is the piece as a whole. You know that I think one of the things that I'm not a selfish choreographer where it's a uh, it's like I am the first to cut choreography out of the show if it's not working. If it's just sort of vamping till ready, if it's vamping till, you know, I may fall in love with different sections of a number, but if they're not working, if they're not telling the story, if not been moving the plot along, I'm the first one to, to cut it. So again, you know, if I'm looking at this great piece of dance, but at the end of that number, if we haven't learned anything, if we haven't really elevated the storytelling, then, you know, I have to really look at it. So, and the audience will inform me on that. But it's not about how they applaud, but it's really how I think that, how, it, does it help the narrative? Does it help carry the plot along? Do we learn it? As well as let the audience have joy, you know, like, do we liberate? Do we give them, do we transport them to a different place? And so, you know, I, I again, you know, I have to look at the whole piece and look at not just each number of nitpicking, but really the piece as a whole. And where are we losing the audience? And is it maybe because this section is too long? Do we are we done? You know, do we is it is it in choreograph is it is the choreography interesting enough? And speaking of looking at the whole piece, are you interested in pursuing the same career path as the Fosse's and the Jerome's of being a director as well, director choreographer in the future? Is that what you now you seem to conquer? I conquered dance. Okay, now I'm gonna get. Is that what's? I know you're doing some already, but is that what's next for you? I think I think being a director choreographer is inevitable for me. When I work with directors like Des Bankinoff or Chris Ashley or Michael Grice, really, and Jerry Mitchell, you know, I just think I have no business because they're they're just at the top of their game. But I think for me, it's really understanding the types of shows that I can direct in Korea and that I want to direct in Korea. And I think for me, are those pieces where the where dance is a big part of the narrative. I think that um, in the same way that I, one of the things that I wanted to say when, you know, in terms of moving from, from a dancer to a choreographer was that, you know, I didn't want to, I wanted creative freedom to, of expression again. You know, I didn't want to be regimented by Fosse's work. I wanted to express myself in my own way. And so as a choreographer, I want to have the creative freedom of expression as a creative force. That means so that I'm not, I can, I don't necessarily only have to express what I do or what I can do through dance, but dramatically as well. And how, and how I take a piece, an idea, a story and guide it under my, my vision. So it really defines specific vision. So if that, you know, that is, you know, I've been, I've, I've done it. I've done it a few times already. Again, you know, I I, I want to make sure that, you know, that I have, I, I think I'm a great student because I went to school, you know, because I studied, I think there's a part of me that's slightly academic. You know, I feel, I think that there are other peers of mine that are gone off and directly quoted that already, but I don't really want to do it until I feel that I've, that I've really studied again. And by, by being, by collaborating with 
these great directors I've learned so much and it's not just about there's just so much that goes into directing a show and a musical and why do you think it is that so many choreographers go on to be such great directors like what is it I was actually thinking earlier today that you know you started out as a dancer and I I would bet that 99% of all Broadway choreographers started out as dancers right I hope so yeah but I don't think that's the case for directors, right? So it's probably not 90, it's probably you know, 90 or 70% of all directors started as actors or something. But yet a lot of choreographers go on to be directors and some of Broadway's best that we've ever had. What is it about the choreographic process or that perspective that also allows you to be a great director at the same time? I mean, when we really think about a musical, you know, when we really think about a musical, I don't know that everyone understands the role of a choreographer in a show, of a, of a, of a, of a talented choreographer in a show. Because I feel like there's a misconception about what a choreographer does in a proper show. And I think that, you know, it's not just about doing dance numbers and doing dance steps. I mean, I think that a, that a, a, a choreographer is like a cinematographer in a movie. The, and the great directors are those that are, are such, are so incredibly confident in their craft that they allow a choreographer to really work with them. How does this show move? How do we transition from A to B to C? You know, how does the scene move? How can you, you know, how do we bring the furniture on? With some directors, I have the freedom to work with my lighting designer about the number. As a matter of fact, my first show that I ever choreographed, which is Mambo Kings, that didn't come in, I got to work with uh, Peggy and Jules. And Peggy and Jules, who are the master, I mean, they are like, you know, in terms of lighting, you know, when I was working with them, they lit my numbers, and I wasn't happy with them. And so I said to Peggy, I was like, Peggy, uh, can we work on this number? And she said, absolutely, we'll come in tomorrow morning and we'll work on it. So from then on, I got the carte blanche that I'm able to have a voice. And, you know, because I sort of have a vision about how the numbers, how I see the, the choreography, you know, the, the choreography and how I, what, I, what sections I want to be lit and I want this one back lit and I don't really need to see that. I need to focus on this. Already, you know, you're beginning to under, you know, you're working with your lighting designer or I'm working with my costume designer on, you know, I don't think these got this costume is going to work. I need a skirt that just can twirl, can make so that it, the turns can be seen. You know, I don't think musically, I don't think, I think that if we land this piece of furniture on this count, I think that that would be more, it would be musically interesting. I can't, because it's, it's a musical, you know, it, it's, it's, so we're already beginning to act as a director of the show, you know, where it, it dances, the show must dance, the show must move, the show, if it's well staged, I think the choreographer will have a big hand in it. And so we're already, you know, we're already working on our craft as a director. Now, Great directors, Dez's, the Chris's, all of those guys. You know, I haven't worked with some other ones, but these, these great directors, they know how to guide their writers. They're, they have a dramaturgical mind. They know how to guide the writers. They figure out how to communicate with them, how to get them. Because it's really not about just getting to show up. You, there's so much work that comes before you even get to the first rehearsal. And that is a relationship between the director and the writer. And that is something that, you know, I continue to, to learn from by watching, by working with these great directors. So that's a craft that, you know, for me, I think is important to, to learn. And I think young choreographers don't understand that that is a big, huge part of it. And again, in the community, they don't understand that. So what is great about people like Rob Enzo? Well, I think Fosse, Bennett, and some of the some of the contemporary ones right now, like Casey Nicola, Jerry Mitchell, who are director choreographers, I think what those guys have done is, is that they've understood what kind of material they're good at. I think they've honed in on the tone of the shows and the kinds of stories that they know they can tell. And Fosse knew, Fosse knew that if he could take a story like Pippin, but figure out a concept and a way into it, and how to he just and it was all, it was all, all of those stories were dark. All of those stories had a had his trademark, and it's all fussy. But he knew how to take cabaret, do charity. You know, they're all they have tonally, they're all the same. But he, and he, Susan Stroman as well. Susan Stroman knows how to do that. She knows the kind of stories you can tell, and she was very good at it. So I think it's really figuring out again for me is understanding. For me is I want to take stories that where dance is a big character, is a big driving force. Yeah. Such a smart and insightful comment, and it talks about again the the business mind of the artist in knowing 
this is what I'm really good at. So I'm going to focus on this thing, and that's going to get me the most success. It's just like you say, I'm going to go Toronto. And I think you're so right, because I know so many artists out there that, oh, I'm going to do everything. I'm going to just do this, this, this. It's actually much better off that you turn down something that you're not right for, because you probably won't do a great job at it. This goes for me in producing as well. So very insightful. What what do you think generally is the current state of dance on Broadway right now as opposed to when you started here 30 years ago? How are we doing? You know, it's it's fierce. It's I'm very, very excited about what's happening right now. And I think a lot of that has to do with I think what there was this this movement that began with with, with dance on television. It began with so you think you can dance, dancing with the stars. You know, dance has sort of taken the backseat for a while, but I think that and also what it's done is it's given the the inspiration, the accessibility to younger audiences. I mean I've seen I went to see a, my, my one of my little nieces is a dancer and I went to see her dance once a couple of years ago and I was blown away by the number of male dancers that were at her dance school. There was a piece that they did where they had 21 boys dancing on stage from the ages of 8 to like 21 and that you don't see that in any dance school and that was because they've been watching television. Now, so I think that also because of social media there is accessibility to what other people are doing, what other choreographers are doing. And and dance is, is, is evolving really rapidly. Like, the stylistically has moved into this other stratosphere. It's what the kids are doing, the way they're moving. And there are people that, you know, sort of turn their back on it because, you know, they're not going through the training to go into SAD or going to ballet class or studying endless hours in a dance studio. It's a sort of different approach to dance. And and so, but people like Andy Lankinville, you know, Andy who's, who's, who's bringing this sort of fresh vocabulary to Broadway. You know, he's bringing, he sort of figured out a way of taking hip-hop but creating his own sense of style making it accessible for younger audiences. But it's also other younger choreographers are looking at somebody like Andy or even somebody like myself and saying, you know what, I can do that. And so I feel like there is a real, there is a freshness to the material, to the, to the, to the, to the language that the, the, the choreographers are bringing to the, to the work. I think that there are, there is more dance on Broadway. I'm, at least I'm hoping. So I haven't seen, I haven't seen Frozen, but I know Robbie, Ashburn, he's a good friend of mine, and I know he's going to put a lot of dance in it. I'm sure Casey's going to do a lot of dance in, in um, Mean Girls. I'm going to put a lot of dance in, in There was a lot of fierce dancing in, in Summer. What else? I haven't seen. I'm looking forward. Oh, and, and your choreographer in, in Once on the Island, who's a, who's a concert choreographer who, who I've followed for a long time, and she's fierce. So, you know, there is, there is a, it's a big component where we're, we're in a few years, a few years ago, we had taken a back seat, and, you know, I, and it's very exciting. I think, I think it's, uh, it's an important time. All right, so that will segue perfectly into my uh, last question, which is my genie question. So you just talked about how great the state of dance is on Broadway. Um, I want you to imagine the genie from Casey Nicola's Aladdin comes to visit you and says, Sergio, I want to thank you for your incredible passion for the theater and your dedication to this industry and all the stuff you've done and are going to do, because I have no doubt in my mind personally that you're going to be one of these director choreographers that we all want to work with. So... What is the one thing, if this genie gave you one wish, what's the one thing you'd ask this genie to wish away from Broadway? What's the one thing that drives you crazy, gets you upset, makes you angry, just, oh, if only this were different, Broadway would be a much better place. What would you ask the genie? I say genie, build more theaters. I think that there is a an unfortunate lack of space for us to be able to showcase the talents and the works of of other less fortunate producers that are not able to raise all of the capital that needs to be raised for the multi-million dollar musicals that are smaller musicals. I, yeah, I mean, there's such competition, and now with with the big, you know, with the, the big shows that are going to be around for even longer. I mean, shows are staying around. I mean, are 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 staying, you know, running for longer periods of time. Well, I uh, would agree with that. As a producer with a line of shows that are looking to come in, uh, I think that's a very good wish. 
Broadway is getting bigger, so we should expand. I mean, it is. I mean, it's a, it's a billion dollar, one point what six two billion? Is that the, the, the number right number? Yeah. Well, I mean, last year one point six two billion dollars. So I don't understand why the city's not investing in each time one one of these big apartment complexes or buildings goes up. I mean, I feel like it should it should be sort of it, the, the city should invest in what we do. I think. I mean, if it's one of, I mean, it is it is such important part part of the of, of the of the tourist attraction. I think mean, that the city should get that. Well you've heard that all you politicians out there <laughs> listening or for those of you listening forward that to your New York City or New York State political <laughs> leader. Thank you so much for being here. It was really terrific. How, How are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you. I'm, I'm very proud of you as well. Oh, thanks. With your success. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for listening. We will see you next time this spring. Go see Summer and go see Jersey Boys now off Broadway. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Thanks again for listening. And just a reminder, if you want to check out that webinar on co-producing on Broadway, if it's something you're interested in learning more about, drop me an email at ken at theproducersperspective.com. That's ken at theproducersperspective.com. We'll send you a link. Have a great day. Ah!